Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we begin with the latest legal and political development for Donald Trump. The former president turned himself in last night in Atlanta. He was booked on state charges that he conspired to overturn Georgia's 2020 election. But unlike appearances for his other three indictments, this time the former president was given an inmate number and a mugshot. He addressed reporters after his 20-minute stay in the jail. What has taken place here is a travesty of justice. We did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. And everybody knows it. I've never had such support. And that goes with the other ones, too. What they're doing is election interference. They're trying to interfere with an election. And Bloomberg's Joe Matthew says this is a moment we haven't seen before, even for the former president. This is absolutely remarkable, and we have to remind ourselves of how unique this moment is. We're we're growing used to this on the fourth indictment, but this has never happened before. And we are seeing the reaction that you might expect uh, from Republicans. Look, we had a lot of Republican candidates defending him, even though he didn't show up for the debate. And Bloomberg's Joe Matthew reports former President Trump is using this moment to reemerge on X, the site formerly known as Twitter. Trump posted his mugshot on his real Donald Trump account, along with a link to his campaign website. Well, Nathan, we continue to follow the latest political developments out of Russia after the death of Wagner founder Yevgeny Prigozhin. Early assessments out of the U.S. indicate the military leader was likely assassinated. And we get the details from Bloomberg's Ed Baxter. The Pentagon says that assessment has Prigozhin on board and killed. Brigadier General Pat Ryder says it does not appear to be a surface-to-air missile that took it down. He says it definitely will change Wagner moving forward. For all intents and purposes, uh, they have their combat effectiveness has been diminished, uh, and they are no longer a, a significant factor when it comes to the the conflict inside Ukraine. Now, UK is also working on the assumption that it was brought down deliberately. Russian President Vladimir Putin has expressed his condolences. I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Daybreak. Okay, Ed, thanks. Let's turn to the markets now. Futures are a little bit higher as we prepare to close out the week. Yesterday's NVIDIA earnings fueled a rally, uh, petered out as the NASDAQ ended the day down nearly 2%. Bank of America says more trouble may be ahead for the tech sector. Strategist Michael Hartnett says high interest rates will eventually eat into the rally. He predicts a 4% drop for the S&P 500 from its current level, but he also says today's remarks in Jackson Hole could flip that script for September. Well, Nathan, Jackson Hole is the big event for markets today. We're all waiting for that highly anticipated speech from Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell. Bloomberg's Tom Keene is at the event in Wyoming and leads our team coverage. Not the first time, but I would say an unusual Friday in Wyoming at Jackson Hole. First, Jerome Powell speaking on America. Pretty relaxed, I would say. We've seen him a lot here on Thursday. A more relaxed Jerome Powell, a less relaxed Christine Lagarde. In the afternoon, the president of the European Central Bank will speak about a troubled Europe. Huge anticipation for the Lagarde speech, the choices she has forward with the September meeting and beyond about a Europe in transformation, a Europe in war. I'm Tom Keen in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Tom, thank you. Tune in for Tom, John, and Lisa with complete and comprehensive coverage from Jackson Hole on a special four-hour edition of Bloomberg Surveillance. It all starts today at 8 a.m. Eastern. And later this afternoon, Tom will sit down for an exclusive interview with the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. You can catch that conversation at the close of U.S. markets at 4 p.m. Wall Street time. Well, Nathan, ahead of Powell's speech, we've been hearing rate calls from both current and former Fed officials. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker and Boston Fed Chief Susan Collins say the central bank is nearing the end of its hiking cycle. But former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard tells us that markets may have to wait for a signal that interest rates are coming down thanks to strength in the U.S. economy. Reacceleration could put upward pressure on inflation, stem the disinflation that we're seeing, and uh, instead uh, delay plans for the Fed to uh, uh, change policy. And Jim Bullard, formerly with the St. Louis Fed, is now dean of Purdue University's business school. Well, there's plenty of other global economic news this morning, Karen. Let's talk China. The government there has unveiled a further easing of its mortgage policies intended to halt a slump in the residential property market and revive growth in the world's second largest economy. 
Nathan, in Europe, Germany's economy exited recession by the slimmest margin in the second quarter, but its sluggish performance continues to drag down growth across the whole eurozone. German GDP for the second quarter came in unchanged this morning. And in corporate news, Karen TD Bank says it's cooperating with a Justice Department probe. More on that from Bloomberg's Doug Krisner. The inquiries are related to TD's compliance with rules aimed at fighting money laundering, and the U.S. Department of Justice is among those making requests. TD said it's cooperating with authorities and is pursuing efforts to enhance its Bank Secrecy Act anti-money laundering compliance program. TD is Canada's second largest bank. It made the disclosure in its third quarter financial results on Thursday. TD also said it may face penalties as a result of the probe. In New York, I'm Doug Krisner, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Doug, thanks. This is Bloomberg. Thanks, Nathan. 507 on Wall Street. Time for a look now at some of the other stories making news around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Amy Morris. Amy, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Getting some fresh poll numbers after Wednesday night's Republican presidential primary debate. One big finding in the new Washington Post 538 Ipsos survey is that former President Donald Trump, who skipped that debate, has lost just a bit of support. And it shows some big surprises for some of his rivals, including Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Now, Republican and primary voters thought it was Ron DeSantis who had the best debate performance on Wednesday night. But the survey of Republican voters also found Nikki Haley gained the most potential supporters, going from 30 percent saying they might support her to 47 percent. And businessman Vivek Ramaswamy boosted his favorability rating by about 10 points that brought him up to 60 percent. But his unfavorability also jumped by 19 points, up to 32 percent. Ukrainian pilots will soon be training in the U.S. on F-16 fighter jets. Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons has an update. Ukraine has long requested access to F-16, saying they could make a real difference in the war against the Russians. Pentagon spokesman Brigadier General Pat Ryder says the training could begin very soon once pilots receive English language classes. The training provided by the United States will complement the F-16 pilot and maintenance training that's already underway in Europe and further deepens our support for the F-16 training coalition led by Denmark and the Netherlands. While the training may happen soon, it's expected to take months before the jets actually make it into battle. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Daybreak. Turning to Chicago, which is blaming automakers as thieves are live streaming thefts on TikTok. That story now from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. The city has filed a civil suit against Kia and Hyundai Motor for failing to include engine immobilizers in various models, causing, quote, a steep rise in vehicle thefts, reckless driving, property damage, and a wide array of related violent crimes in Chicago. Thefts of Kia and Hyundai cars have surged across the country after social media users exposed security flaws, sparking what has been termed the Kia Challenge, where people live stream their larceny. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Daybreak. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris, and this is Bloomberg Karen. All right, Amy, thank you. And it's currently 5.09 on Wall Street. for the Bloomberg Sports Update. And here's Dan Schwartzman. Dan, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Starting out in Major League Baseball, the Nationals beat the Yankees in the rubber game with their three-game set 6-5 to five in the Bronx. There's the Red Sox dominating the Astros 17-1 to one as Boston sets season highs in runs and hits with 24. Meanwhile, the A's getting past the White Sox 8-5. to five. Orioles knocking off the Blue Jays 5-3 to three, while the Twins beat the Rangers in a battle of division leaders. A drive to left field. Hit the ball into the second deck. Lynch finally hit a home run with a man on base. That's courtesy of Valley Sports North. Minnesota outlasting the Rangers 7-5 to to open up a six-game lead in the AL Central. Angels 2A star Shoei Otani will continue to hit the rest of the year despite tearing a ligament in his right elbow that may require Tommy John surgery. The frontrunner for AL MVP will not take the mound the rest of the season. The 29-year-old who will be a free agent this offseason leads the majors in home runs with 44 while also winning 10 games on the mound. One-time Washington Nationals ace Steven Strasburg has announced his retirement. The first overall pick of the 2009 draft signed a seven-year $245 million contract in December of 2019 but has thrown just 528 pitches since then. 
The final week of the NFL preseason schedule getting underway with the Steelers finishing 3-0 after shutting out the Falcons 24-0. In the other game, it was the Colts beating the Eagles 27-13 as Indy goes 2-1 this preseason. That's your Bloomberg Sports Update. I'm Dan Schwartzman. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning, I'm Nathan Haker. It is another remarkable moment in the precedent-shattering political career of Donald Trump. The former president has turned himself in for the fourth time on criminal charges, this time in Fulton County, Georgia, over the effort to overturn the 2020 election there. But this time, Trump's been given an inmate number and a mugshot, something we have never seen before. And for more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg senior editor Bill Ferries. Uh, Bill, good morning. We have gotten used to saying that former President Trump breaks norms, but you really do have to step back and take note of just how norm-breaking this is. Right. We've never seen anything like this. The president uh, had a very brief appearance at this jail in Fulton County, Georgia. You know, went in, had the photo taken, left, and made some remarks at the airport and flew back to his resort in New Jersey. But this is one of those things that you have to wonder whether it's going to linger in the, in the collective memory. And when we see the primaries unfolding, It'll be something that voters will uh, likely have in their mind when they go in to decide who the Republican challenger to President Joe Biden should be. Well, in some ways, it seems as though the former president wants this moment to linger in the public memory. I mean, it's amazing that he's been off Twitter. I guess we call it X now uh, for uh, more than a year now. And he uses this moment to get back on X and post his mugshot. Right. You know, so far, he really has been made of Teflon when it comes to these cases against him. I think this is the fourth time he's uh, faced charges and had to go in to a courthouse for this kind of a thing. And so far, it has not dented his approval rating within the party uh, really at all. His core base of supporters is still there. Uh, You know, we saw earlier this week he was able to skip the Republican primary debate uh, and really not suffer any consequence for it. He is leading, he is leading the field by uh, as much as 40 points in some of these polls. So until uh, there's another dynamic in this race or until one of the other candidates is able to show more traction, uh, he is able to use these events as basically fundraising opportunities. And we know from the campaign filings now that many of the funds uh, that he's raising, many of the dollars he's raising, are actually going to pay the legal team to help keep fighting these uh, these charges. And I understand most of this funding as well is coming from small dollar donors. You mentioned the fact that he hasn't seen much erosion of support from the base. What about the more established wings of the Republican? Republican Party. I mean, even on the debate stage, the candidates were asked whether they would support Trump even if he were convicted of a crime, and most of them raised their hands. Right. You have seen some of uh, really the larger donors still kind of holding off, and some who had uh, gone in early to support candidates like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis uh, started to withhold their their support once they saw DeSantis kind of eroding in the polls. And that's really been kind of the story of this year as uh, as Donald Trump faces uh, increasingly risky legal cases against him. His support has been steady or climbed. And while, the, you know, the people who have come closest to being uh, the successor to the throne, the heir to Trump, uh, the people who are really going after that hardcore of MAGA voters, they have largely either stayed flat or seen their support decline. So it's uh, it's been an interesting dynamic and a very tough one for those who see themselves as President Trump's successor. Does it become more difficult for the former president to maintain that support when we do expect that he's going to start seeing more and more court appearances alongside the campaign calendar for him? He's going to be juggling a lot of uh, different scheduling conflicts, just to put it in uh, really mild terms there. Yeah, right now he's really he doesn't have to do much campaigning. He's the he's the leader uh, in the Republican race. But as you mentioned, some of these cases, they're, uh, they've been building up all year. The court appearances are going to start increasing when we get um, into 2024. 
He has a, he has a hearing in a, in a New York case at the end of March, just I think a couple weeks after the, the, the Super Tuesday primary. Uh, he may even have more cases later this year. That's going to start to become a very difficult dynamic, I think, for the president to manage. He will have to be out on the road campaigning, and he's going to be have to be have to be cutting some of those uh, travels short to get back uh, to appear in a courtroom. How that plays with the Republican base is really anybody's guess. They've stuck stuck with him so far, um, but it could be kind of a strange split screen moment that again we've never seen in modern U.S. politics, where uh, you know he's leaving the campaign trail to uh, stand in a courtroom and deal with some of these cases. Um, that's you know we uh, we don't know how that will play out and whether also some of the other candidates in this race uh, find a way to break through. Uh, and build a little bit more support. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.